I'm going to try something a little different this morning. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and I'm going to say a phrase. And in your mind, hold on to your reaction, okay? So we're going to close our eyes. You ready? I hate my family. You can open them now. Have you ever said that? Maybe you never said it out loud, but maybe you've said it in your mind and in your heart where God hears and sees. Maybe you wouldn't use that phrase for your whole family. Maybe just one person. Two. Three. Or maybe you say, I I don't hate them. I just find them difficult. That's a Christian word, right? I find them difficult. I'm trying to love them well, but they just make it so hard sometimes. Or maybe you say, no, I I don't find them difficult. I really hate them. And if you knew them, you'd understand. Now, these thoughts can often lead us to make this wish. I wish I was born in a different family. Or we ask God this question, why did you put me in this family Or why, God, did you allow this person into my family? Or, God, why is my family so messed up? Or why don't they love me? Maybe you're on the opposite end of the spectrum. You love your family, and you you wouldn't change a thing, but you say this to yourself. God, thank you for my family, but why have you put me in this one? Like, why in your good graces would you put me in this great family? These are the questions, I think, to one degree or another that we wrestle with. And I think it's worth us considering this morning. Now, many of you may or may not be aware of this, but I've recently spoken with the elders, and we've worked out a schedule that I would be here two weeks out of the month uh, to provide messages for you. And I'm really excited to preach the Word of God and for us all to grow and to change together. And I thought, what would I speak about? What am I going to preach about? What am I going to dive into the scriptures that I think would be edifying for me and for you? And I just could not shake the narrative of Joseph and his brothers, which is found in Genesis. It struck my heart. You know, the story of Joseph and his brothers has been a great comfort to me over the years. It is my favorite Old Testament narrative and account, and it provides comfort, conviction, challenge, and all the rest. I'm, needless to say, I'm very excited. (laughs) And so I would like to call the name of this series, The Many Colors of Providence. So as I come here in the coming months and and preach to you, we're going to be going through the series that I like to call The Many Colors of Providence. Now, what is providence? Okay, so maybe you're familiar with the term, but maybe you're not. But for those of you who are familiar with the term providence, God's providence, you might confuse it with another theological term, sovereignty, God's sovereignty. Now, the two are indeed linked, and sovereignty, when we talk about sovereignty, sovereignty refers to God's absolute rule and control as king over all creation, his rule over everything that happens. But providence... Providence, and I would like you to write this down if you're taking notes, providence is this. Here's a definition of providence for you. The means by which God enacts his perfect will in his creation. Definition for providence would be the means by which God enacts his perfect will in his creation. And in the narrative of Joseph, there are many practical lessons, themes, and truths, but the one thing you get hit over and over and over the head with is that of God's providence. Well, let's not delay any further. Please open your Bibles to Genesis 37, verse 1. Genesis 37, verse 1. Now, Genesis, that's the first book in your Bible, and we'll be looking at the first four verses of chapter 37, and I'll be reading from the ESV. Now, I know what you're thinking. Tyrus, I know the story of Joseph. (laughs) But I don't want us to make the mistake that because we may be familiar with this account, that we know it or we have nothing more to learn from it. I want us throughout this series to look at it with fresh eyes, to God's living 
an active word. We are never fully done with an account of Scripture, no matter how many times we've heard it. But let's try to look at it with fresh eyes. We're just going to be in the first four verses. Genesis 37, verse 1. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Now, that's just the first four verses. And it serves like an introduction to what we're going to go through in the next coming weeks through our series. But now that we have a picture of this family, a small picture, Let's take a closer look at some of the characteristics and some of these people that we will come to know. Now, we're going to look at three distinct characteristics of the people that are mentioned in the first four verses. First is Jacob's favoritism. Jacob's favoritism. Then we're going to look at the brother's hatred. And then we're going to look at Joseph's righteousness. But first, let's look at Jacob and his favoritism. Jacob, he's mentioned in the first verse, he lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. Now, who is Jacob? Jacob, who God also names Israel, we see that in verse 3. Who is Jacob? Well, he's the grandson of Abraham. Abraham, the patriarch. Remember, God reveals himself as a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham was given a promise, a covenant by God. That covenant, that promise from God included land, seed, and blessing. What was that land, the promised land? Well, it's the land of Canaan, where Jacob is living with his family. And it also involves seed. Another word for seed is offspring, descendants. God promised Abraham that he would have descendants as numerous as the stars. And the last one was blessing. That through Abraham's family, the entire world would be blessed. And more specifically, that there would be one that would come through this line of Abraham, who would bless the entire world through redemption. But, so this is Abraham's family. He's Abraham's, I'm sorry, um, Jacob's grandfather is Abraham, and his father is Isaac. But let's look at Jacob's shady past, you know? We might know a lot about Abraham, but what do we really know about Jacob? Well, Jacob has a bit of a shady past, and there are reasons for his favoritisms in regard to, to Joseph. Now, Isaac, when he was old, he was going kind of blind. Isaac had two sons, Jacob being the younger, Esau being the older. And the older son is supposed to receive an inheritance and also a blessing. But Jacob wanted that blessing for himself. So this is what he does. He dresses up like his brother Esau and goes to his father and pretends to be Esau. And Isaac, who can't see that well, gives him the blessing instead of Esau. Esau, understandably, is very upset about this. And he makes this vow. When my father dies, I'm going to kill my brother and get revenge. So Jacob's pretty scared. So he runs away to his uncle Laban. And his uncle Laban had a beautiful daughter named Rachel. And Jacob, he fell in love. Everybody say, aw. Aw. Love at first sight, right? And so he's like, I, gotta, I, I, gotta, I want to marry your daughter, Rachel. And Laban says, well, I'll let you marry her, but you got to work for me for seven years. And the Bible says that those seven years just felt like a few days to Jacob because he was so in love. Again, say, aw. What a beautiful love story, right? And the night of the wedding, everything's going great. And all of a sudden, the next morning, Jacob realized that he has consummated the marriage with the wrong girl. It's actually Rachel's older sister, Leah. So it turns out that Laban pulled an old switcheroo, and Jacob's upset about this. I mean, you can understand how someone would be upset that someone would pull a switcheroo when I couldn't see that well at night and give something that belonged to somebody else to them. Oh, wait. Kind of like how you did, Jacob? You see, you reap what you sow. And 
although Laban, what he did was wrong, Jacob learned a lesson. It's wrong to deceive. And he's going to keep learning that lesson throughout his life. But he says, you, you pulled the switcheroo on me, Uncle Laban, and I really, I still want to marry Rachel. And he's like, okay, well, work for me another seven years. And so he gets to marry Rachel. He works for another seven years. And this begins a bit of tension in this family. Man has two wives. It's hard enough just to have one. Um, <laughs> but now he's got these two wives who are always competing, and they're sisters, so the competition's really real. But here's the thing. Jacob loves Rachel. He doesn't love Leah. That's going to cause some problems. And Leah is sorrowful, but God has compassion on her. And we have a cross-reference for you on the screen. Genesis 29, 31 through 32. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, not just disliked, she was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Reuben, for she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. So she's hoping that having children, especially in the ancient world, was one of the greatest gifts for women. It still is. But they tied a lot of their weight and their value to this. And she thinks, if I could give Jacob sons, maybe he'll love me. But it doesn't work. But she does have four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And Rachel, who's barren, says, well, we can't have that, can we? we got, no, you, Jacob, you give me children or I will die. And Jacob's like, well, I'm not God. I can't open your womb. What am I supposed to do? So Rachel has an idea. Well, I'll give you my female servant, Bilhah, to you, and we can have children that way. And so that's what they do. So Bilhah, the servant of Rachel, has intimate relations with Jacob and has two sons, Dan and Naphtali. Those are the two sons mentioned in our main text today, the sons of Bilhah named Dan and Naphtali. Well, Leah gets upset about this, so you can't have that. So she, uh, she gets her servant girl, Zilpah, to go to Jacob now. Things are getting kind of messed up. <laughs> uh, and now she has two sons, Gad and Asher, the other two sons that we see in our main text. But then, of course, the feud doesn't end there. Rachel and Leah have an argument over plants, and Leah says, I'll give these plants to you in exchange for a night with Jacob. And so she goes to Jacob, you got to lie with me. I, I, basically, I paid for you. And Leah gives birth to two more sons, Issachar and soon after Zebulun. But don't worry, if you thought they were having way too many boys, there is one girl. Leah has a girl named Dinah. So, but through all of this, all these years and all the backbiting and all the children, Rachel still hasn't had a baby. But God shows compassion on Rachel. And she has a son named Joseph. Joseph. And this is wonderful. Finally, his favorite wife has a child, and Jacob decides to go back home. But he knows if he goes back home, he's going to have to confront his brother Esau who vowed, if you remember, to kill him when Isaac had died. Will Esau be merciful? Has he forgotten? Is he still holding a grudge? He probably is. But there's one piece of scripture I want you to see for us to get the context of this family dynamic. It's Genesis 33, verses 1 and 2. Jacob sees Esau from afar, and here's what happens. Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming with 400 men with him. Now, if you're Jacob, remember, your brother vowed to kill you, and now there's 400 men across the way coming at you. So his natural assumption is these guys are here to kill me and my family. So what does he do? So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in front then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. You see what he's doing? He's saying, if Esau's here to kill me and to kill some of my family members, the children I really don't care that much about, they can die first. But my favorite wife and her son, we'll keep them in the back, because if they can get away, they can get away. The reason I'm giving you all of this context is to say this. The favoritism is real, 
It's deep and it's destructively wicked. But Rachel had one more son, Benjamin, but unfortunately she dies during childbirth. It says in the scripture that we read that Joseph was favored more than all the other sons because he was a son of Jacob's old age. But Benjamin's actually the youngest son. Now, we don't know this. This might be a little bit conjecture, but is it possible that Benjamin isn't the favorite because his mother died giving birth to him? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But needless to say, this is a broken family with hardships with infighting, and we can relate to that. It's possible that Benjamin isn't the favorite just because he's the youngest, and Joseph has had more time to know his father and develop a personality and those things. We don't know, but I'm trying to show you that this family's broken. It's It's been marred by sin. But this favoritism, this sinful favoritism that Jacob is showing his family culminates in Jacob making his favorite son a coat, this coat of many colors. His father makes him a coat. Now, what makes this coat so special? Well, your Bible says that it's the robe of many colors, and you might have a footnote that says it has long sleeves. Now, coats like this usually denote the person who wears it as royalty or as someone of great importance. So think about this, the other sons. Remember that time when dad was going to let us die and let Joseph get away? Now he's got this brand new coat that basically means that he's the prince over all of us, and they hate him. Parental favoritism creates family dysfunction. Parental favoritism creates family dysfunction. We're getting a pretty clear picture of this family. That's the wickedness of Jacob's favoritism. But let's look at the brother's hatred. The brothers, why do they hate him? Well, the Bible tells us in verse 4. It says that they saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. But here's the interesting question. Why is their hatred directed at Joseph and not Jacob? You think about this? Like, Joseph didn't ask to be born of Rachel. He also didn't ask to be the favorite. It's Jacob who's making all the decisions to put his children into categories. Why don't they hate him? Well, I think that James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 gives us a little context to this. James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says this. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Now, what's happening? Joseph has something that they want, their father's affection and love. Now, that's a good thing to want, amen? That's a right thing to want. They should get that. They should have the love and affection of their father, but they don't have it. So we can understand why they would hate Joseph. He's getting the natural, good, loving affection that they should have. However, they let that desire, that jealousy of Joseph, they let that natural affection that they should want turn into something sinful and wicked. But you say, Tyrus, like, wouldn't you feel the same way? Yeah, I can understand. But we have to remember that that which is understandable is not always commendable. That which is understandable is not always commendable. They should have gotten that love and affection, but they didn't. And that desire for love and affection is fine. But they let that natural desire grow into something that was evil and destructive and led them to covet against Joseph and to quarrel with him constantly. The Bible says they couldn't even speak peacefully to him. They couldn't give him a good greeting or salutation. Is it ever right to hate your brother? Even in this understandable situation? Well, what does Jesus say? On Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. 
You have heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will not uh, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. What's Jesus saying? Well, in another text he says that if you look on a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Well, this text is saying something similar. The hatred you hold for your brother, it's as if you're murdering him in your heart. Jesus wants us to understand, and we need to get this, murder begins long before the knife is drawn. It's first done in the heart. They had murdered Joseph in their hearts many times, which will drive them to soon do something very, very wicked to him. So we understand why the brothers might hate Joseph, but it's not commendable. But there's another reason, I think, why they hated Joseph. What's the other reason? We're going to look briefly at Joseph's righteousness. Now, we see from Joseph in verse 2 that although Jacob, he was Jacob's favorite, he was not spared from hard work. Where is he? He's out tending the flock with his brothers. He's working with them. So Joseph, and we know and we'll learn throughout the narrative of Joseph that Joseph is a hardworking man. He has a great work ethic. So he's not lazy. The problem with revisiting uh, s- stories from the Bible that we know so well is that sometimes we let movies and all these other interpretations guide our thinking. Well, Joseph, he's a favorite, so he really didn't have to do that much work. But when we just look at the Bible, we see that Joseph, from the start, seems to be a hardworking man, a hardworking young man. And it says that he brought a bad report to their father about the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. What's the Bible, I think, is implying, it seems to be a contrast between the character of Joseph and the character of that of his brothers. Matthew Henry in his commentary says this, Joseph gave his father an account of their ill conduct that he might restrain them, not as a talebearer to sow discord, but as a faithful brother. Now, you know those people. They can't wait to, they're tattletales. Like, they can't wait to just catch you and then tell someone like, oh, I'm telling. And the only reason they really want to tell on you is because they enjoy getting you in trouble. And that's not something to be commended. However, there is something to be commended when you are working with people and you have integrity and you do not join them in their ill conduct and you have to give a report to your supervisor, in this case, the father. And Joseph told the truth. We don't know what it was they were doing. The Bible doesn't tell us. But there seems to be this contrast, both here and throughout the story, that Joseph continues to be seen as righteous and his brothers as wicked. So why do they hate him? Remember, he's the youngest brother, and yet he is the goody two-shoes, essentially. But righteousness is not determined by age or experience. It's determined by character. They hate him not only because he's favored, but because he's good. You know this. You remember back in elementary school? You always hated the good kid. Why? He didn't do anything wrong. We don't like him because... But because he's good, it shows someone else how ungood we are. They hate him not just because he's favored, but because he's good. And that should strike a similarity in our minds as we're reading this narrative. The story of Joseph is about how God uses the rejected godly brother to save, to preserve, and reconcile the covenant family. God providentially put Joseph in this family and uses their dysfunction to accomplish his divine plan to protect them from a future destruction. But what's the true problem with Joseph's family? What's the true problem of your family? It's the fact that we're all sinners. We all have a sin nature. Joseph and his brothers grow up in a pretty messed up environment. 
But that's not their main problem. You see, the sin nature that we all have, can it be agitated by outside forces? Absolutely. But nevertheless, we all begin as bad people who are, who are wicked in nature. And that nature can be more agitated through nurture or lack of nurture. But why is that? Well, we're in the book of Genesis right now. What happened at the beginning of the book? God created the heavens and the earth and created everything in this universe. And he created mankind. But man chose to sin against God. He chose to go his own way by partaking of the forbidden fruit that God had forbid them to eat. And because of that, man is now fallen and cursed. And he needs to be redeemed. And now each and every person is born in sin, with a sin nature that rebels and hates God. But God made a promise that there would be one from the seed of the woman who would come and redeem the people. And God works through the offspring with blessing, this blessed one who is to come. Fast forward in time to Jesus, who is born of the Virgin Mary. He is the promised seed, the one to redeem his people. But he wasn't liked. He was godly. He was favored and rejected by the Jewish people, by his brothers. And he lived a perfect life without sin. And he goes to the cross and he bears the sins of his people. And he's crushed under the righteous wrath and judgment of God that each person deserves because of their sin. And he dies. But amen, three days later, he rose again from the dead and walked out of that tomb. And that is God's promise that through repentance and through faith in Jesus Christ alone, in Christ's righteousness, that you and I can be forgiven of every sin and enter into this beautiful covenant family. That's the story of the gospel. And Joseph's story is a type and shadow of that. But what's the main theme here in these four verses? What can we take away for us? What practical application can we take away? I want you to write this down. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Your family is the providence of God in your life. Your family is the providence of God in your life. Remember, providence is the means by which God enacts his perfect will in his creation. But why did God place me in my family? That's the question we've been trying to answer, right? Well, the Bible has something to say about that. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Acts chapter 17, verses 26 through 27. And he made from one man, that one man being Adam, the first man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined, he being God who determined, allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place. What does that mean? God, in his providence, decided what time you'd be born, what family you'd be born into, and all the things that you know. Why? that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. But the problem is we don't seek him. The scripture says that no one seeks for God. Why? That's the sin nature. But God in his grace seeks us and finds us. If you're here and you're an unbeliever, you don't know anything about this Jesus thing. What you need to recognize is that everything in your life has been a part of God's sovereignty and providence. The family, all the situations you've gone through, and it's brought you to this moment right here in the sound of my voice, whether you're here or you're listening to me online. God has collected all of those experiences so that you would hear the message of salvation and repent of your sins and turn to him. You have no hope in yourself. You cannot trust in your own righteousness. It is as filthy rags before this holy God. It is only by faith in Christ that you can be saved. Recognize that everything 
that has happened has been in his perfect will. And you can be saved. If you're a believer here, this should be a time of remembrance for you. You need to remember that all the experiences, even your messed up family that got you right here, that got you to hear a gospel message, that took you to church on Sunday, that read the Bible to you as a child. God used all of those things, even your imperfect family, to get you to him. So what's some application we can take away from this? I got two sections of applications, one for our natural family and the other for our church family. Here's some application that I want you to think about this week. The first one for your natural family. No matter how messed up they may or may not be, recognize that God placed you in your family for his divine purposes. If you're a believer, be assured that it is all for your good, as the scriptures tell us. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Second, if you're the only believer in your family, recognize it is only by grace that you aren't just like them. This should create compassion, not contempt, even if they have contempt for you. Joseph was saved by his faith, not by his works. The scriptures foretell that. And the only reason he was righteous and they weren't was because of God's grace. It's the same for you, believer. And it should create compassion for your lost family members, even if they hate you for being a Christian. Don't look at them with contempt, no matter how hard they make things for you. Have compassion on them. Parents, avoid favoritism and partiality with your children. Don't do it. It'll bring a wake of destruction that you'll never know. If you're guilty of that, repent and ask your children to forgive you. Yes, humble yourself enough to ask your children to forgive you if you're guilty of that. If you're holding hatred against a family member this morning, repent. If that hatred has led you to do things you're not proud of to them, Ask them to forgive you. The others, don't be a person who makes strife in your family by your sinful words, actions, and attitudes. It's one thing that you create a little bit of friction because you're being righteous, because you're just living out your Christian life. It's another thing when you're creating strife and tension because of your sinful actions, words, and attitudes. Don't let that be you. This one's really important. Be determined to do well to them when possible. There are always opportunities for you to do good for your family. When it's possible, try to do that. This one is one also that I think is for someone here this morning. Forgive those in your family who have sinfully withheld affection from you. I know it's hard. Jacob's sons should have received that love and care from him. They didn't. So should you. But God wants you to forgive them. God wants you to forgive them. For the church family, this one's one of my favorites. Because you have been wrapped in the righteousness of Christ, know this. Know that all of you are favored sons and daughters of your heavenly father. God doesn't have favorites in his family. Why? We're all wrapped in the righteousness of his perfect son, Jesus Christ. He sees you as the favored, perfect son right now. So remember, remember that all of you are favored sons and daughters of your heavenly father. Which leads into the next one. Don't let jealousy of God's gifts to other believers get the better of you. You are loved just as much as them. And when you forget that, look to the cross. See Jesus who died for you, who died for your sins, who took the punishment for you. He loves you just as much as he loves them. And he's given you gifts that he hasn't given them. Don't let jealousy of God's gifts to other believers get the better of you. 
if you are holding hatred against a family member in Christ, another Christian, repent of that. And if that hatred has caused you to mistreat them, ask them to forgive you. Again, don't be a person who makes strife in your church family by your sinful words, attitudes, and actions. And be determined to do well to them. There are gifts you have. There are people that you can reach. There are people in this church body who you can serve. Determined to do them well. Joseph could have been born to any family. But God chose this one with all of its dysfunction to bring about something good. And we'll find out what that good was later. Your family is God's providence in your life. God's redemptive purposes for them have been and will be revealed in time. Some may have helped you bring you to salvation. And others have and continue to work for your sanctification, even if they don't know it. But we know that God's providence for you, believer, is for your good and for his glory. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for your sovereignty and your providential work. You're working all things together for good, even the hard situations of our family. Help us to view them with compassion and not contempt. Help us to see the beautiful story that you weaved through Scripture about how you even used the sinful actions of men against Jesus to bring about your perfect will of redemption on that cross. Help us not to forget that we are, if we have trusted in you, that we are wrapped in the righteousness of Christ and have your favor, and we are all loved. I pray that those words would comfort someone this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.